Good morning. What are you doing? Shaking your hand. Okay. So, um, yeah, good morning, everyone, to the first um, International Pirate Parties International Conference, uh, Think Twice, that we're doing. I'm sorry that we are 23 minutes too late. It must be some Illuminati thing. So we, um, well, not everybody is here, I hope, but uh, some people will come, otherwise we will have trouble to fill the speaker slot. So a lot of speakers who will have this, uh, the talks today are not have arrived yet. We'll see. <laughs> um, so welcome everyone again, and thank you for coming to our conference. And uh, my name is Gregory Engels, and I would like to begin a short introduction about this internet before we all disperse into the separate breakout rooms. And I also hope that the more people will come till, they, till then. So we have the conference think twice. Okay. So some technical infos before we begin into the dive in the next two days. So the Twitter is Pippi International and the hashtag is two, two T's or Tick Twice 14. Um, you can follow the changes and all announcements on the website of uh, TT14 pp-international.net. Um, like if anything will change in the agenda, that might happen since we are quite <laughs> changing into the every 10 minutes right now. Um, so please follow that. We also try to print out um, during the next hour and put out print out somewhere here in the, in the rooms that you can see what's up next. Um, we have emergency phone if anything is happening and you're missing a plane or whatever. It's my phone, so write it down so you can call me at any time. Not now. <laughs> But then after the, afterwards. So um, we do have um, a stream on, I guess. Wolfgang? Any reaction? No, he's not listening. So we are supposed actually to stream this conference. Uh, all three rooms. Yeah, and he now, well, there's some delay. This delay is about 20, 30 seconds. So now it was on the stream that we are streaming. <laughs> so I got an okay. So we are streaming. So it's live in the internet. Hello, internet. Yeah. <laughs> so right now in the room we all we have like 30 people. Um, actually, we have about 70 people registered. We have 30 over 30 speakers. I don't know exactly how many because some had to cancel the talk at the very last notice because of the strike um, of, of uh, Frankfurt Airport yesterday and some other issues that happens. So um, my best wishes for people to get it well again and um, well to be able to present uh, at another opportunity so we have uh, the, the, this is the first time we're doing that so this is a conference um, from the pirate parties international the pirate parties international is an international umbrella organization of pirate parties representing currently pirate parties from 43 different countries and as um, international political organization um, our task is to spread the ideas of the pirate movement worldwide by means of campaigns and by means to go in and talk to people at international conferences. So we've been to a lot of international conferences recently, like visiting the WIPO meeting and the WTO meeting in Bali and others. And we found it very interesting to get in touch with all the other people that were at these conferences from other NGOs, um, from scientific researchers that present at that conferences and we could profit a lot from, <coughs> from this exchange of ideas and uh, uh, bring it back to the pirate parties is what we think is uh, our task now. So we have thought that organizing a conference that would bridge between the worlds of NGOs, the academic research and the pirate parties, uh, international pirate parties to spread the ideas uh, would be a good thing to do. So we organized this first one. And for this first one, we were challenged with the question, well, what should it be about? 
it's a hard time to develop a conference where you think everyone yeah, want a, a cool conference with cool topics, with people coming from different countries and talk about what drives them in their political uh, career, in the change, what they're facing in their everyday world around them. So we should, and, and on the same time, we are like pirate parties and the parties of the digital revolution and also quite nerdy people a lot, maybe not many more in Germany and Sweden, but a lot of pirate parties worldwide are consist of quite technical people. And if they go to conferences, they usually talk about, I don't know, like SQL, Ruby, uh, computer stuff. And it's also very exciting stuff, but not for everybody. And for bridging into the world of NGOs and um, academia, we thought it would be good to actually to take a step back and to look into the broader picture of society, of what is the next challenges that are around us. So we were thinking about, well, the broader stuff. So we choose uh, to speak about human rights, the creativity, and the revolution that is happening. So we want to focus on new ideas and new challenges that will be that surround us today and tomorrow, rather than analyzing who has started the World War I, like, for example. So, <laughs> so we call this um, away from keyboard. And away from keyboard is the idea that we want to focus on society and everything that surrounds us. So I want now to take the opportunity to thank our sponsors. Not without them, without their contribution, this conference would be probably unable at all uh, to um, happen. So the first, um, the Pirate Party, uh, Pirates Without Borders, which is an also an NGO. Do you want to say for yourself what you're doing? Yes. Yeah, we have more on there from Pirates Without Borders who contributed financially to the success of this conference. So please, Mora. Thank you. So I hope you enjoyed the slides here. Um, Pirates Without Borders is an NGO. Um, it started in 2010, was active about for two years. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, we were quite inactive for a half and a half and one and a half year. And now we want to get active back and we start, we start with a sponsoring the international conference. And I hope you will enjoy these two days. Thank you very much. And I'd also like to thank for support of streaming services. You're going to say the word yourself? No, you're busy working, right? So we have somebody from streaming services who organized the whole streaming, the three parallel rooms, and we have the satellite dish built up outside that we can have satellite uplink internet. Um, so the stream is something like maybe up to a minute after life. Um, but it's, uh, it's okay, so if you see a reaction on Twitter, it's maybe something later than it was in the reality. But still, so very um, huge thanks to Wolfgang from Streaming Services who organized this all. And also my thanks to the Pirate Party of Frankfurt and Pirate Party of Germany who have also provided um, logistical and financial support to this conference. So, and now I need to look at the clock walk. Yeah, exactly, half an hour. So yeah, we have our first talks scheduled to in, in 11 o'clock. And the format of the talks should be, and if you are speaking, listen up, it's 45 minutes slots back to back. That means like five minutes time should be allowed for people to change the rooms. So you should aim for 35, 30 minutes talk and 10 minutes discussion or five minutes discussion. So the plan, is plan for discussion, plan for questions. And um, so we can have an exchange, and then we will go to the next room and have an ex excellent talk. Um, and follow the agenda changes. So <laughs> that's, that's what I did. So um, we had a hard time actually finding a keynote speaker. Um, because a lot of people we asked um, canceled on the last time, on the last notice, because stuff is going on in the world, and um, there are some crises. And then we had, um, well, um, it's, it's regardless who, I wouldn't tell the names that we have asked for, but and, and now are not with us, because it would be like very bad name dropping. Um, so actually Bill Gates was coming, but now he's cancelled. No. Uh, 
So you have me instead. I'm, I'm very sorry I'm not Bill Gates and I'm not um, Angela Merkel and uh, neither uh, Martin Schulz or whatever. So, but I will do my best to give you one kind of a short talk that I imagine is interesting for a lot of people and if not interested, well, I'm, I don't mind. Um, but actually I would like to talk about, um, for a half an hour that we have left, still next talks, about how 3D printing will change everything. And by everything I mean everything, like a lot of aspects of our everyday lives. And, um, well, by the way, this is on the this is space shuttle on a plate, and this space shuttle is printed on a 3D printer out of scallops. You know, this muscles, yeah, the scallops. So this is scallops turned into form and printed with a 3D printer and then deep fried. So this is a deep fried 3D printed space shuttle made up of scallops. So just to give you an idea of what happened. <laughs> So um, you know about probably about this. If you talk about a lot of people who have ever heard about 3D printing, think about that. But this is the first open source um, available, very broadly available 3D printer called Ripraff. Um, the first model that has evolved since then. You can buy um, commercial made models like this Ultimaker or there is industrial 3D printer which are a little bit bigger and you can buy them today. They're available today for quite not that expensive. You, you could have a battery of them. <coughs> it's more expensive, but it's, it's very affordable now. So basically, the technique itself is not very new. The technique started like um, about 25 years ago. It's about the same age as inkjet printers. And basically, a lot of 3D printers are like inkjet printers. So they use some material and they print it on a surface and then they go up a level and print another level. And this is available commercially. This is a 3D copy machine. You can buy it at one, well, like actually cheap distributor. Uh, for less than 1,000 bucks, um, you get a 3D scanner, a laser scanner, and a printer. So you put something inside, like this bunny, and it scans it and it prints a copy for less than 1,000 bucks. So commercially available today, you don't need to be a tinker, you don't need to be an engineer to operate that. It's, it's very available and affordable. And um, I remember like 10 years ago, a laser printer was also more than 1,000 bucks um, expensive. So or maybe 15 years ago, but actually I remember that time. So if you extrapolate in the next couple of years, this will be available in, for every home if you like. But this is our printers that print this plastic with something like yogurt, uh, yogurt uh, cups are made of that in very, very cheap plastic, but this is you this works. But you can do other stuff. So this is a 3D printed silver jewelry, which you can order online. So you send your wireframe and you get with the mail a printed and polished um, silver, well, this is an octopus ring. Um, you can do everything what you like. This is um, commercial available. Well, actually what they do, they print it with uh, some kind of a bag and then do mold, um, molding for the, the production process, but still it's coming entirely out of your wireframe model. Um, there are other stuff you can print. This is not entirely, it's not at all limited to plastic. So how about chocolate or uh, candy? Well, this is a printed candy. It's entirely eatable and it allows for um, makers, for the bakeries to do some very creative stuff that what, what's, whatever they want. <coughs> this is uh, sugar. Um, there have been, well this is claiming to be the first printed 3, 3D printed dress, um, which is actually printed out of a lot of several pieces and then put assembled together. So it's, it's still hard plastic, it's not very, um, comfortable to wear, but actually, well, looking stunning. Maybe about because of the model that's inside it. Um, they are printed shoes, and this was like the first shoes that were printed, and then some kind of uh, had some um, treatment of their surface. Um, but this was like the first shoes, also looking very interesting, and it's not coming very bright out, but it has very organic structures. It looks grown. 
So it's a kind of an eye catch, not for everybody, but you know, <coughs> in real life. Um, and this was the first one. Now we have um, entered to the age of commercially made 3D printed shoes, or better say, individually fabricated um, for, expected for you. So this is a website of Nike called Nike ID, where you can actually assemble your own shoes, and this shoe is been fabricated and produced exactly for you and nobody else. And actually, if you are very rich and uh, you can pay them for that nobody else will be able to assemble the same shoe in this configurator, like my, uh, Michael Jordan does, so he, he wears his very own shoes and nobody else can wear the same because he did it in the, in the configurator of this website. Uh, but actually, there is more than that. So this is a New Balance, another company that makes shoes. And this is a 3D printed shoe. It doesn't look like it, but it is 3D printed. It's actually sintered. So it's not a pilot printed like additive printing, but it's inside of a kind of a laser cut from directly from the material and then assembled together. But it's also printed digitally um, from a digital wireframe that's ordered individually for you. So you can scan your feet, you can design your shoe, or somebody can design a shoe and then print it, and it's completely individually printed. And this is available today as a commercial product. Um, what's next? Well, this car is printed entirely in 3D, using commercial industrial 3D printers, with metal sintering. Every part of this car, including the engine and the plexiglass windows, are all printed. It's UV. Um, it was a design prototype, but actually, what does it mean? Uh, it means that if it's spread and uh, car manufacturers will start printing cars instead of doing long, long years designing them and then manufacturing them, but instead like you can select your own cover for the car, like a little bit like iPhone, you, there's a lot of variety, so you can just say, okay, I want to, that cover for my car, or, we'll, or even entire parameters, you can click and you order a car and two weeks later you get printed your own car and delivered with your design and your understanding of how you want to do it. Um, printing is, uh, is very advanced now. So this is a multi-material, it's a speaker, it's printed out of 12 different materials and assembled together, but actually it's also printed and looks beautifully. Um, it's used in the medicine, which is the next big thing in the medicine, in the prosthesis. Um, so this is a um, prosthesis of, um, of a Joe. There's a 92-year woman get as a first 3D printed Joe in Japan, um, but this is um, exactly fitting, so it's no problems. And also the um, projects that are printing bone marrow directly and printing knee uh, implantates and also knee pieces, and so direct printing inside the human body is the next thing. We have how how advanced is this? And this is from last year, um, about like eight months now. So they are able to print, and you see it's printed because it's layered, um, a lithium battery directly on the spot where it needs to be in the electronic. And this is, if you see in the right corner, it's 200 micrometer. So it's, it's less thin than a human hair. It's a micro battery, and it just needs to be filled with um, um, electrolyte, and it works on the spot. So you, the problem. So you don't need to assemble anything. So you can print the whole circuits, boards, including the power source, and they will work. Um, it's even less than that. There's a printer called Nanoscribe that can print structures like that with a see, with 20 micrometers scale. So it's with a single detail, it's less than one micrometer. Um, it's the same scale Empire State Building in a 20 micrometer scale. Um, but there's also larger structures available. Um, so this is a project called the Landscape House, which is um, printed in, in concrete. And people, if I talk about concrete printing, people always say, yeah, what about our, uh, the armation? How you put steel in it? The answer is, uh, you could do that. You can assemble a printer that could arm armation in it. But actually, it's not needed because they have developed a new kind of uh, concrete that is 10 times more solid uh, and stable than the previous uh, version. So we don't need um, 
for smaller structures who don't need our mission. So we can print um, something like this Mildus uh, band house um, entirely. And this is a scale that's um, it's not, a, well, it's printed, but it's only a six meter big, so it's not to scale right now. But actually, how it's doing, it's like that. So this is a 3D printer that is supposed to print houses. So this is a working prototype that can print stuff. You see, it's a frame and it's a it's a it's a print hat and it's drive around and prints pretty much the same as um, a small 3D printer would do, but do it in, in the landscape. Um, or this is another version of um, of another process that would do spider board that um, spider bot that use cables and suspended cables and, and can do even have more freedoms um, in, in in the room. Um, we can, this is a printed roof element. Um, there's also other projects like Viti House CC that um, do amazing stuff. They do actually, well, create a wiki of um, wooden cut houses from by the 3D mill. Which 3D mill is, it's not exactly a printing, but it's the same individually manufacturing uh, out of a computer aided uh, with no, well, but large knowledge needed, you buy a pack of wood, you drive it to the computer mill, and then you upload a file with a USB stick that you take from Wiki, from the Wiki house you see, and you have a structure like that in about minutes. And you can send, assemble that everywhere in the world, and everything you need for that is wood and a computer mill. Uh, but you can also, well, the, if, if the architects get that into, the, into their hands and they got it, um, they are very creative people and they try to change stuff and see what can they do with the new materials they get. So this is a silk, a project called silk. And basically it's a house model. It's, it's printed, it's 3D printed right now with plastic, but actually um, they plan to build this. Um, and how it works is they created some kind of wireframe and then they put silk worms, like the, um, the, the, the turn into butterflies after all. So they put it in a cage with silkworms, and the silkworms just start spinning around the structure. And this is the organic structure they got, and then they scanned it with the computer and built it. And said it's very stable, it looks something out of your dreams, maybe not the best ones, but <laughs> um, still, it's, it's completely uncanonical architecture. And it's the able to build that. And actually NASA is planning to use a 3D printing system uh, system like pretty much like uh, you saw in the previous frame um, to build a moon base to print it out of moon dust that is found on the moon surface and well we will get to there eventually um, we just need a space elevator to get up there that whole material and then we can print stuff in the moon out of what is available there well this is a vision um, what's today so this is also where also there's light there's darkness and um, you probably <coughs> all heard about the so-called 3D printed gun. This is the infamous Liberator gun, um, which is actually a design of proof of design, but you shouldn't use that because that will happen if you try to fire it. It will explode in your head. Um, not good. But actually this been gun through all the news stations because they say, oh, there's a 3D printed gun or um, gun parts, actually. Uh, like in high capacity magazines for AK-47. Um, these are 3D printed stuff and these are not... Let's allow some bad guys to actually with, with some cheap plastic and some cheap printer print out some dangerous weapon. Yes, that's that's a danger. And um, what's the answer for that? Through the ban 3D printing should be regulated, should we regulate plastic? Um, because, well, they kind of ceased um, um, reporting news about the 3D gun, printed guns because, well, they explode if you fire them. Um, so right now it's more of a, of a danger, but not, really, not a real threat. A real threat is, and I predicted will be the next thing that they try to, to um, drive the fear inside this uh, whole stuff is the 3D printed landmines. The landmines, let's look at that, they are available. You can print them very much uh, today. They don't have much metal, so they are not really detectable with a metal detector, like traditional landmines. And you need a small um, activator for them. 
and then you can well you can dig them in the ground and they will not be noticeable and if they explode uh, on first contact well that's the purpose of a lab mine so these are much more dangerous than 3d printed guns and um, if somebody will come to idea to to do that it will be bad and this is the question which is actually what I have for you. So how we should deal with that? Because this is the, one of the challenges we have. We have other challenges. Um, but actually how it will be changing, shaping us. So this is a, one of the first worldwide uh, local print shops for 3D printing. Well, this one is actually located in Beirut. And um, it's open inside. You can find it in a sculpture who will print for you whatever you like. Um, you can send him. Um, Stuff will bring it with a USB stick and he will print it and he will get it later. And um, there are some other examples of how it will start. Which 3D printing is basically individual mass fabrication, individual fabrication. Uh, well, this is a bakery, an automated bakery uh, as employed by the Lidl and Aldi shops in Germany, very large um, uh, grocery uh, stores chain. And, um, about a year ago, about two years ago, they introduced, maybe three years ago, they introduced this automatic bakery, which I told my kids, and I saw kids, this is a replicator from Star Trek, because you go there and push a button and say, I want computer, I want bread. And they say, one moment, please, I get a bread. It worked pretty same, the same way as Star Trek, I don't know how, they just get bread on the press of a button. Um, but inside, there's an automated bakery, so it takes some, um, pre-made stuff and then bake it, ready baked for me. Um, the consequence of that was that they removed the pre-made bread from the stores and only had this bakery. Um, the pre-made bread from the stores turned out to be produced by, a, um, by an Italian corporation um, in seven um, uh, plants, seven plants in the north Italy, um, with over 5,000 people working there. And um, as they removed the order for the old pre-made pre bread that was every morning was, or every night was driven uh, with lorries through whole Germany to distribute it, and all our bread was made in Italy, but nobody actually had an idea. Um, so the consequence was that like a couple of months later, these plants had to close, because, and these people, or most of these people became unemployed uh, because all the bread was made in the store and not more in the plants. Well, this is a huge consequence, but it's not as huge as it will come um, if, like, um, if, like, the houses will start to get printed on a large scale. Because in a house production, you need, like, three months for digging out the hole, three months for building the walls, and then three months for putting stuff inside the walls. And basically, you still need the time to dig the hole, but you don't need three months to build the walls. You just print them inside of a matter of a couple of hours like 20 hours printing instead of three months construction means much less human work that's required. There might be more engineers and more printing experts, but much less unqualified people that actually building walls. So this had the consequences. Um, the first and obvious consequence for us, the pirates, is of course that the copyright system that is in there today is not built entirely. Uh, for 3D printing challenges. So what about this? This is a 3D printed model of a Yoda, a character that is trademarked uh, by Lucas Arts Corporation. But actually what they have print, what, what they have copyright on images they have created. How it is a copyright an idea of a graphical image. That is not Yoda made by them, but somebody else made it. And it's printed out of, of a wireframe model. So how is copyright applies to that? And it's really like not stealing, not, it's really a question. So of course the people say that should be extended to such things. Uh, but what is it? Is it industrial design? Well, this is just a figurine that has no function. Um, there is something that's new here and it's not really covered by existing framework of regulations and laws around copyright and intellectual property. So this is something that we will see a lot of a fight uh, inside that. And of course, intellectual rights holder uh, corporations that are profit from the current system will um, will put pressure into the system to apply this to the whole stuff as well. We will see that. Um, consequence tax system. 
if nobody is working or less people are working, we have a problem. This is actually the first tax report to the world uh, from about 7,000 years ago for Babylonians. Well, it's a tax report um, reporting how much work has been done. So actually our tax system originating from the Babylonian times is centered around the fact of work. So if there's no work, there's no taxes. Uh, so we need to change that, obviously, because it will not work in the long scale. So for pirates, is there, of course, the answer is uh, the introduction of a basic income. And the basic income, because no, well, there's no less people, the structural employment, there's a less workspace available, so if people need to get moved into something else. So basic income could be one of the answers, and for that we need to change the taxes, otherwise it will not work. Um, the train systems. The train systems are focused pretty much on like, like free trade, like trade, like exchange of goods and services uh, across borders. Um, the, all the export stuff will not work in the same way it works now. Because right now, corporations exploit the cheap labor somewhere else to produce um, offshore and to produce uh, pieces of products that they sell somewhere and then ship them around around the globe. If everything can be Productive on the spot or nearby, there is no need in transport of all the goods across the oceans, but just the raw materials. Um, so this will dramatically change actually of how the trade, the fundamental um, foundation to the trade systems. This is my bits of thought that you can take and develop. Well, my name is Gregory Engels. I'm co-chairman of the Pirate Flags International and also here local pirates. And if you have questions, now we have like three minutes left and then we need to change rooms and go to the next talks. And thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> questions? Yeah, so, so you, you said that um, printing weapons might be a big problem. Landmines, stuff like this. Yeah. So, what about the materials? So, I saw, okay, sugar can be printed, but most it's plastic, isn't it? No. No. So, what, what but the question was um, I thought about print, printing, well, I, somebody called me, but I'm not answering right now. Um, so, I hope it's not an emergency. So, um, the, I repeat the questions that are being heard on the stream, yeah, right? So, you asked about I thought about the um, 3D printed guns and landmines and said it could be a danger in there. Um, but um, the problem is the materials and uh, you said, but it's right now it's only plastic that can be used. And the question is, what, what can be used for printing? So I saw So what can be used for printing, the question. So I tried to explain in my talk by giving you an example that actually nearly every material can be used for printing now. So at home, for most people available, is plastic. But actually, if you take it one level up and don't pay like thousand bucks for your printer, but maybe like ten thousand bucks for your printer, you can print nearly everything. So like an industrial sinter that you sinter laser that you can melt metal um, costs about two hundred thousand euro. Uh, but it's as hard as you get. You can make steel printed stuff with that. And so it's just a price of cost, and the cost is degenerating rapidly. So if you needed to spend several million dollars um, a couple of years ago, it's in hundred thousands now, and maybe twenty thousand in five year time, or even less, because this technique becomes much, much more available. And basically you can use any material that is today, you can pl print plastic, you can print rubber, you can, if you can print it, or you can cut stuff out of it, you can do it. Okay, all of yeah, maybe it's, it's not a question. Um, and uh, for the people that are here that are from this area, there is a trade show every year which where you can look at those things happening. And sintering for metal starts a lot lower than two and some euros already. So it's, it's it's up to get. Okay, yeah, they, 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 they notice what so there's a local trade show that local. shows of printing in the in the local area and the metal Sintering starts much lower than 200,000 euro. Yes, that was the upper limit. Yeah, but you can do gold and anything. Yeah, yeah. you can you can sinter gold and with, actually with, everything. With gold, so I'm repeating for the stream, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know. I'm not. Okay. <laughs> the thing is, um, gold is printed by using gold powder, 
which is heated by laser. And this is really complicated because the um, gold powder is very explosive. So this is, really, this is 200,000 or more to do this. Yeah. But um, it can be done. Well, there's some materials that have more difficulties to print than others, but it all can be done. I summarize. <laughs> okay, um, I, you go next. Yeah. Um, how about the impact in the pharmacy branch? Will it be available to print drugs? How is the impact in the pharmacy to drugs? In the pharmacy area, will be able to print drugs? The answer is yes, but not tomorrow. Um, there is a system um, that calls a uh, system on a chip, or actually labor on it, uh, um, well, labor on it, uh, la la labor on chip, which um, is printed on glass and using different um, chemical reactions in a micro uh, system that actually can be used to synthesize whatever system you like. Well, this is a, a, a research field right now, and there are systems available in the lab, but not commercially right now. But actually, in the, if, if when they will finish, and we'll see that they are successful because they can synthesize more and more and more stuff on the, on the glass chip, they can print a, a lab on the on like uh, like this big as uh, a telephone and you put stuff in and it's down come to drugs and, and it can be available in field it can be available like for military use um, for creating also like um, drugs in whatever <laughs> yes this uh, is one of the consequences that we will face but it's not the next one but it's the one like two years later yeah um Annette and then Markus okay I have more uh, this is for me um, you really fascinating presentation illustrating two problems we have in politics since many decades or more than 100 years or more. One is that the progress in technology uh, reduces the workload. We always had this for many years. So yeah. whenever uh, some uh, work becomes more effective, you need less work. And the uh, principal political question is how do we share the benefits? Is it only some two capitalists, or is it? Uh, is there? Can we organize politics in a way that everybody can benefit from this? So, the, in future, perhaps not much work is not, not necessary anymore, but there must be some justice in sharing this benefit. And the other problem is a typical pirate problem, where, um, well, with the trademarks, we also had this problem already in music industry with copy machines. Uh, with printing and so on. And it's also a principal problem which goes beyond only <coughs> the 3D printers. So we must organize uh, life in a way that all creativity uh, gets some benefits for those who provide it. So composers and musicians must earn some money. But on the other hand, we must share the benefit of this in a, a way that not only the few how do we profit from it, but everybody? Okay. I'm not going to summarize that because it was too long, and we're actually over time. So the next talk, and your talk, uh, <laughs> is starting like a minute ago. Uh, so probably, uh, it's, um, I'm, I'm sorry, it's best to, to come to me personally and ask me questions. I'm here all day and tomorrow as well. Um, the conference will not go on without me, I guess. Um, but thank you very much, and I hope um, I'm not, I have no exact idea what who is next here in this room. But actually, to give a logistic, the room number two is that room of, around the corner, and room number three is one in the back. So please make a choice. And I think right now for the next slot, they only have two talks because one had to be cancelled. So we only have room one and, or maybe not even one. We only have room two or three, so nobody stays here. So, whoever is asleep, we will see it. Probably we could say a little bit about uh, the talks that are coming now, so that you can take a shot. Yeah, do you have, a, do you have an agenda? With one one oh. talk in room number two will be the talk from Sam. Yeah, in round number two is the Sam Kali, who is talking about creating a writable API for society. And in room number three will be Annette, who will talk about transparency in nuclear uh, disarmament. The, the, how is it pronounced? This arm is okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And um, well, we are over time. So, and since we don't want to be the whole day over time, please move quick. <laughs> Thank you very much.